how do you adapt a game's story into comic form when you only have half of the source material to work with? Sonic 3 and Knuckles is heralded by the fanbase as having some of the franchise's best storytelling. Without a single line of dialogue, these games manage to introduce a fan-favorite new character, expand the war, and tell a cohesive story where each level felt connected as we explored a brand new location. It gave the comics a lot to work with, or at least it could have. We all know that Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles were originally meant to be one game, but their release was split into two titles. That forced the comic to follow suit and work with what they had at the time. As a result, Sonic 3's story ran from issues 33 through 38, while Sonic & Knuckles' story was retold in issues 45 to 53. Likewise, this video will cover the Sonic 3 portion, with a separate video inbound for the and Knuckles part of the tale. Subscribe now to ensure you don't miss that follow-up. Initially, I assumed that this closely coincided with and promoted the release dates of the games, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Sonic 3 released in Europe on February 24th, 1994, with Sonic & Knuckles following on October 18th that same year. Meanwhile, issue 33, which kicked off the Sonic 3 part of the story, hit newsagent stands on the 20th of August 1994. I know it says the 2nd of September on the cover, but thanks to Sonic the Comic the Podcast, I'm also now aware that this date is for shop owners to remove it from the shelves. Likewise, the Sonic & Knuckles portion of the story wasn't told until the 4th of February 1995. It gives us a pretty weird looking timeline where there's about a 4-6 to six month gap between the release of each game and its respective comic adaptation. While I understand that the writer, Nigel Kitching, and artist, Richard Elson, presumably had to play the games, then write and draw these stories, that still seems like a long time, even if they didn't get advanced copies of the game or preview materials from Sega. I can also tell you that not all of our favourite moments from those games made the cut, but thankfully, we still get a story that fits the lore of the comics world, is beautifully drawn, and provides a thoroughly entertaining read. We start with one of the annual summer specials. These were bumper-sized, unnumbered issues that would come out around the UK's six-week school summer holidays. Thankfully, this would be the only time that a core story would start in one of these specials, and even then, it's largely skippable. I missed out on this back in the day, and it didn't impact my enjoyment of the story one bit. Knuckles, Guardian of the Chaos Emeralds is written and drawn by Nigel Kitching, with an uncredited letterer that the fanbase believes to be John Aldrich. This is Knuckles' debut in the comic, and we can see that he's oddly purple. Yeah, Knuckles' colour was up for debate for a while, with him appearing to be pink on the PAL box art of Sonic 3. We can even see that his colour palette has been changed between the base Sonic 3 standalone and the locked-on Sonic 3 and Knuckles, changing both his fur and socks, with the SNK box art and title screen affirming that this bruiser is definitely blood red. There's another visual change that's hard to see in this story, so we'll come back to it later. For now, all I'll say is that's not a tuft of white fur around his neck. Speaking of, you might have noticed that these are some of the cleanest scans we've seen yet in these videos. They were provided by Dan200, who has been creating homemade graphic novel collections of Sonic the Comic. Dan hasn't released these publicly, as these are intended to convince publishers that there's a market for re-releasing these stories in a collected format, so I'm unable to share the files with you. Here's hoping Dan's successful in showing the powers that be that people still care for these earlier continuities. You can support the cause by retweeting his posts on that site I still call Twitter, while I lament Sonic Prime's multiple missed opportunities to celebrate Fleetway, Archie, and the 90s cartoons. In a single page, Nigel introduces the floating island as being mythical and legendary, then reveals that it actually exists and its sole inhabitant is Knuckles. We also learn that the Echidna is awaiting the return of his people, implying the rest of his kind are out there somewhere. The economy of the storytelling is something I always appreciate and respect whenever I revisit Sonic the Comic. From there, the remaining three pages have Knuckles investigating the recently crashed Death Egg and meeting Robotnik, along with a tease for what's to come. 
to heap some more praise on this. Having Robotnik send out a drone to do recon and find help is a nice character detail. Very fitting. There's some inconsistent use of heavy blacks to provide ominous shading and a sense of threat once Knuckles enters the Death Egg, building tension and playing on the idea that we, the reader, know Robotnik's evil, but our hero is none the wiser. Finally, we have a seemingly throwaway line that confirms the existence of two sets of Chaos Emeralds. A set keeping the floating island aloft, and the set Sonic quite literally keeps on ice back on Mobius. This is quite different to the games, which imply only one set of Chaos Emeralds. At the start of Sonic 3, the Blue Blur is in his super form, having collected all of the Emeralds in Sonic 2. The floating island is downed in the water, presumably since Sonic 1 or even earlier, as we also collected an incomplete set in that first outing. Knuckles then steals the magical gems from us. I have some minor criticisms of the comic itself. We only see a tiny bit of the Death Egg's exterior, and Knuckles isn't exploring it for very long. This fails to give us an indication of the satellite's size or potential threat. Page 2 sees Knuckles travel to the impact site in the ice cap zone, but when you only have four pages to work with, this seems kind of wasteful, essentially only giving Kitching three pages to work with. If Knuckles just so happened to be nearby, then the story could have had some more breathing room. Again, these are minor criticisms, and overall, I do like this short story. Issue 33 starts with a news report about the Death Egg's plummet from orbit. Nigel smartly writes around a potential plot hole here. In the game canon, Sonics 2 and 3 happen back to back. The Death Egg that crash landed on the floating island is the same one we took down at the end of Sonic 2. The mobile ports and origins even reinforce this with an additional scene. The comics, meanwhile, started after the release of Sonic 2, and we've already seen the Death Egg crash land in issue 6's Attack on the Death Egg. Nigel's answer is simple. This is the Death Egg 2. He's somewhat ahead of the curve here, seeing as later games would also introduce new Death Eggs. I've legitimately lost count of how many times Robotnik's built one in the game canon at this point. Artwork-wise, there's a nice touch in that the background elements are all coloured in different tones of light blue to help direct the reader's focus to the characters and more important objects. We do get some whiplash as we transition from the Freedom Fighters arguing over whether the floating island exists, to Sonic and Tails immediately finding the floating island. In an ideal world, I would have liked a couple of issues worth of build-up and searching. As it stands, there is no mystery, it's immediately resolved. Which is a shame, as we then spent the next four pages seeing Sonic and Tails exploring the Marble Garden Zone. This could have instead been used to add ambiguity to whether the island exists or not for those of us who didn't have the Summer Special or the game. There is good stuff in the four pages we got, though. First and foremost, some light ribbing between the Freedom Fighters after Porker and Johnny were proven right. I always like seeing the cast have a little bit of banter. We also get to see a new visual design for Sonic. The last time Elson drew this character, it was very much the air quotes American or Mohawk Sonic, resembling the US box art design. Here we get something much closer to the Japanese depiction. The European games use both Sonic designs interchangeably on our box art. It was an inconsistent mess. This isn't quite Elson's final design, he'll still update and change his approach, which we'll see some of in this very story arc. Right now, the head has two spikes, with the third connecting Sonic's head and back. That will be changed out later on for three spikes on the head that don't connect to Sonic's back, but this is very close to being recognisable as Fleetway's take on Sonic. From here on out, we start to see the triangular approach to a head on Sonic much more often too. We see Sonic use his force field from Sonic 3, a nice nod to the at-the-time new mechanic in that game. Sadly, much like the source material, Sonic rarely uses this ability, and it's quickly forgotten about. Finally, for those who think Sonic's just unnecessarily mean in these books, he makes a self-deprecating quip to himself about needing to learn that there's a time and a place for sarcasm. 
I still maintain that those of us who live in the UK and are familiar with that culture view this Sonic very differently than, say, an American audience would. The issue ends with Sonic running face first into a still very purple Knuckles. If I were to be picky, I would say that Knuckles' fist seems a tad small here, especially as the next panel reveals his boxing gloves to be about the size of his head. But I suppose Richard needed to keep the entire thing in frame and make sure it was recognisable for readability. I would have preferred if the page count had been optimised to allow for Sonic hitting the fist to be at the bottom of the previous page, with the page turn revealing Knuckles. That would have been more suspenseful and impactful, but again, minor gripe. This does show us that Knuckles' white marking is actually replaced with a silver collar. I can only assume this came from misinterpreting the pixel art, however, it does emphasise the Echidna's rougher exterior and brute strength, adding to his character. I still find myself drawing Knuckles with this chunky necklace in my own fan art because it just feels right for his personality. I'd love to see Sega adopt, or at least acknowledge it in the games. Hashtag bring back the bling. Part 2 opens with Sonic on the ground, with Robotnik and Knuckles looming over him. For some reason, Knuckles is now on Robotnik's left, not his right, as seen in the final panel of the previous issue. Possibly because Robotnik speaks first and this change helps the letter around. But I'm probably the only person to even notice this, let alone care. The Dutch angle is employed in order to get all of the key information in frame without taking up too much of the overall page. I suppose we could also make an argument that this shot is typically used in film to imply that something's not right or cause a sense of unease, and yeah, Sonic doesn't lose, so this is unusual, but I genuinely think that would be reading too much into it. We get further confirmation that there are two sets of Chaos Emeralds, as Robotnik manages to manipulate the conversation to suit the narrative he gave Knuckles, where Sonic is an Emerald Thief who terrorises Robotnik and his people. Acting to protect the floating island set of Emeralds, Knuckles knocks Sonic back to the ground. There's lots to love about this panel. Knuckles' punch goes in the opposing direction of the reading order, causing disruption to the reader and helping us feel the hit. We get some follow-through and implied momentum thanks to his windswept dreadlocks, we have some manga-styled action lines to help pull us into the shot, while Sonic's twisted body points us downwards into the final panel. Bravo, no notes. I love how Sonic immediately figures out what's happening, but fights Knuckles anyway. I'm not sure if this is Sonic's pride, if he's excited to fight a strong opponent, or whether he's just running a distraction and buying time for the instruction he just gave Tails, but it also leads to a wonderfully choreographed, albeit short-lived, fight. Sonic's fast enough to dodge a straight punch, so the Echidna goes for area of effect attacks, tearing up the ground. Sonic counters with his speed, creating a whirlwind a la DC's flash, which launches Knuckles into the air. He burrows into the ground to mitigate the fall damage, and our blue boy follows him underground. This leads to a panel that reminds me of those moments in Dragon Ball, where the animators took a well-deserved coffee break, and we only see brief flashes of the fighters clashing in mid-air. Sonic seemingly wins the first round, and as Knuckles gets to his feet for another go, Tails arrive to capture Robotnik and the pair escape. This shows a lot of growth, maturity, and tactical thinking in Sonic. I've gone on record as calling this iteration of the character impatient, arrogant, and impulsive, yet here he is with a plan that was clearly agreed in advance, and the common sense to withdraw from his bout with Knuckles and retreat once his objective's been achieved. This is arguably the first time we can point to Sonic as showing leadership qualities in this title. That's interesting as other Sonic media tends to pass that role along to other characters, such as Sally Acorn or Amy Rose. In those continuities, Sonic's a hero, he gets the job done, but someone else does all of the planning and takes responsibility. Is he necessarily a good or infallible leader? No. He makes some controversial decisions as the book goes on, but it's fascinating to see him try his hand at it. Issue 35 opens with Porker Lewis questioning a newly captured Robotnik. It feels like Elson's really found his groove in terms of making the comical Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog design feel more intimidating. He towers over the pig, really filling the page, and we again see a tilted frame to try and cram more of the Doctor in. 
emphasizing his physical size. In addition to Robotnik's physical presence, he's also psychologically threatening. When Borka asks about new Badnik designs, the dictator taunts him by saying there's one just the right size to contain a pig. We get some lovely panel use here, as a close-up of Porker noticing a rumbling sound doesn't just interrupt the pig's questions, it disrupts the page, popping out and making the reader stop for a moment to share Porker's discomfort. The team know what they're doing. Knuckles has borrowed into Robotnik's cell to free the Mad Doctor. There is a weird colour mistake here, as the front of the Echidna's shoes are green. We know about the yellow socks and knuckles getting recolored between the original release of Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, but the green has never been at the front like this. It's also fixed in our next look at his shoes four pages later on, so yeah, oopsie! Another potential mistake is the lettering placement. We usually read comics left to right, top to bottom. Knuckles' speech is on the far left, indicating he speaks first, but Porker's exclamation on the far right is higher, making for an awkward reading experience. The content of the balloons doesn't provide clear context, these lines could be said in either order, so it just feels weird. Likewise, the pop-out panel of Porker calling for help. It takes space, emphasis, and impact away from Knuckles' appearance. It kind of feels like Richard literally drew himself into a corner, as the main panel can only just about squeeze Lewis's head into the shot. I'm not even sure this panel is needed. Sonic comes running when Porker calls for help, but Knuckles breaking in caused a physical rumbling and a loud sound. Pretty sure that justifies Sonic realizing something is wrong and coming to Porker's aid. We also have two instances of characters moving in opposition to the reading order, one of which works while the other seems like an error. It makes sense for Knuckles' entrance to cause discomfort, as it reinforces the effort he's made to bust through the ground, and it gives us pause as readers. Sonic's panel, however, should absolutely be flipped. Just take a look at the amount of difference this simple change makes to how the page flows. The diagonal staircase now brings us straight into the final panel. Robotnik has reached through the bars and has Porker in a chokehold. He's demanding the Chaos Emeralds in exchange for Lewis's life. Sonic again shows his leadership here. He remains calm, making a quip about Porker being a, quote, professional hostage, and doing his usual thorough job. British sarcasm at its finest, before immediately agreeing to hand over the Emeralds. He even immediately shuts Porker down when the pig tries the classic, don't worry about me trope. He puts his team's safety first. We get a nice lore reminder that the Emeralds become unstable unless they're refrigerated, calling back to issue 27, where the gems vanished after Sonic first collected them. We'll understand why Nigel's reminding the reader of this shortly, but why tell Robotnik? Surely it's smarter to hand the Emeralds over, let them become unstable, and scatter again a la the Dragon Balls, and recollect them. Robotnik uses this opportunity to make the lies he's told Knuckles seem credible. See, I told you he had them. Reinforcing Robotnik's narrative that Sonic is an evil Chaos Emerald thief. Sonic again smartly takes advantage of Robotnik's tendency to gloat, and gets some intel out of his nemesis. How did Knuckles find their secret base? Turns out, the mustached menace has a GPS chip in his tooth. Yeah, weird, right? Again, Sonic's cool as a cucumber, knowing the Kinterball computer will be tracking the duo's escape and taking the tornado out to intercept the pair. He's showing a lot of not only determination, but rational quick thinking too. His response to this situation shows why he's in charge. One thing I don't get is why Knuckles had to rescue Robotnik. If he can reach through the bars and put one of the Freedom Fighters into a stranglehold, he could have used a hostage to negotiate for the Chaos Emeralds and his own release at any time. I guess waiting for the Echidna has one advantage. He lets Knuckles witness that Sonic did indeed have the Emeralds. But outside of that, his not-quite-red-yet minion doesn't really contribute anything here. Robotnik immediately retreats to the floating island where he could have rendezvoused with Knuckles, still allowing the tease showdown cliffhanger of a rematch between Sonic and Knuckles to remain the same. Arguably, it may have been more impactful to save Knuckles' reappearance until this final panel. Speaking of, the first panel of issue 36 is basically a redraw of issue 35's final panel. 
allowing us to make some rare direct comparisons. Knuckles is definitely red now, no two ways about it, but 36's version of this shot is weaker overall. The proportions seem squished, a little too tall and not quite wide enough. New expressions change the subtext, Sonic has gone from concern to being ready for a fight, while Robotnik has switched from glee to anger. At the same time, there's more distance between the combatants in a panel with much more breathing room, where the tighter framing of the original seemed far more immediate and tense. All of these changes combine to completely shift the power dynamics. The end of issue 35 implied Robotnik felt the win was assured, while Sonic was in trouble and on the back foot. Comparatively, the start of issue 36 shows us a calmer hedgehog in a more controlled situation. Sonic's more confident and self-assured, while Robotnik's now frustrated and acting as a disrupted party. That carries into the action. Sonic deflects Knuckles' blow with the second, and potentially last, use of his force field in this book. We even get a brief explanation of how it works for the warheads out there. Sonic quickly controls the fight with a display of special techniques, with Knuckles resorting to using the island's traps to pin his opponent down. This time, it's Knuckles who makes a tactical retreat, a role reversal from issue 34. We see some playful banter between Sonic and Tails as he initially pretends to be trapped before easily freeing himself. The blue blur claims he wanted to see what Robotnik's plan is, his curiosity getting the better of him and giving his enemy a deadly opportunity. In the Temple of Chaos, a stand-in for the as-yet unrevealed Hidden Palace, this issue had a remove from display date of 14th October, four days before the global release date of Sonic and Knuckles, we're told that the six Chaos Emeralds were split into 12. I really love this idea, as it allows the events of Sonics 1 and 2 to happen without implying that the floating island has been, well, not floating for potentially years at this point. We don't have to ask why did the Emeralds vanish from Hidden Palace and into the special stages for Sonics 1 and 2. What was the inciting incident, thanks to these twin sets? Knuckles also mentions a seventh Chaos Emerald, stating that it controls the power of the other six. That one line handily explains why they became unstable and scattered after the events of Sonic 1, and why the Emerald count changed between the first two games. Sonic simply found an incomplete set in that original outing. Eighteen years later, the games would make this official canon in a new ending cutscene for Sonic 1 in the Sonic Origins collection. You have no idea how much I cheered on seeing this in-game, as the comic's suggestion that this was the case very much became my firm headcanon, making Origins feel like long overdue validation as well as a rare official acknowledgement of Fleetway. Robotnik dismisses Knuckles' concern, saying he's created a device to act as a stand-in for the Seventh Emerald. The Tyrant combines the twelve jewels back into their original six, which, given the context of the game's release date and seemingly not getting advanced materials from Sega, somewhat predicted the Super Emeralds. That's simply wild to think about. Unsurprisingly, Robotnik immediately channels the power of the Emeralds into himself, becoming an invincible god. Funnily enough, not the only Sonic media to do that, and not even the only time this comic would see this plan enacted. Sonic arrives too late and laments his decision to let Robotnik go to see what he was up to. Again, believable character flaws. Now, I do have multiple complaints with this penultimate page. First, it breaks a golden rule of comics, show, don't tell. He's turned Tails into glass. Cheers for that, Sonic. Pretty sure we could see that for ourselves. Second, the conflict is again resolved too quickly and easily. Knuckles pulls out the real Grey Emerald, having lied about it being missing, and uses it to immediately and effortlessly defeat Robotnik. So, we can get an entire issue of Robotnik escaping captivity, but we can't have even a single page of Sonic and Knuckles teaming up against a god-form egghead? This makes me painfully aware of the extremely limited page counts Kitchen had to work within, and it's a curse a comic never quite overcomes. We get a final page confirming that Robotnik isn't dead, just stripped of his powers and teleported back to Mobius. Knuckles is also shown to be smarter than he looks, having kept the Grey Emerald as an insurance policy in case Robotnik betrayed him. 
Sonic offers for Knuckles to join the Freedom Fighters, but the Echidna declines, stating that it's Sonic's fight, not his. Knuckles has his own responsibilities. That, generally speaking, is something the comic balances really well. Knuckles feels like he exists in his own world, with his own war, adventures, and priorities. He's allowed to live his own life, instead of merely tagging along as just another member of Sonic's crew. Anyone who is disappointed with the Knuckles TV show should definitely read some Fleetway. We're not quite done yet. Issues 37 and 38 contain the ending of the Sonic 3 portion of this story, as well as Knuckles' first cover appearances. Kind of surprised it took this long, in the form of Robotnik's Revenge Parts 1 and 2. We see Sonic and his crew packing up to leave their now compromised secret base. The final piece of the puzzle being to transfer the Kinterball computer system to a Mobius ring, essentially using a ring as a USB stick. Artistically, there's a lot going on here. Sonic's head now sports three spikes that no longer connect to his shoulder spines, bringing us even closer to Elson's most well-remembered design. Likewise, we now have a new method for drawing Sonic from behind, making his quills seem more three-dimensional. Finally, we have Robotnik's approach. As a kid, it felt like he was bearing down with the force of hundreds of badniks, but if you inspect the art, you can see that Elson was able to give the impression of an overwhelming army, despite only drawing five robots. The massive dust cloud does a lot of the heavy lifting here, and my word, the use of blacks and the expression on that caterpillar is chef's kiss perfect. We then cut to Knuckles, who has a new mission, to remove all traces of Robotnik from the floating island. We see him approach the Death Egg, now looking much more like its Sonic 3 design. I do feel that Knuckles is too big here, throwing off the sense of scale. If we were to draw a perspective grid over this, either Knuckles would be a giant, or the Death Egg would be fairly small. Tensions rise back at Sonic's base as Sonic and Johnny have no choice but to hold off Robotnik's forces while Porker finishes transferring Kinterbor. Something about this shot always reminds me of the opening to Lilat Wars, Star Fox 64 for the Americans in the audience. It's incredibly effective, even if they're facing the wrong way. Again, let's see if we can edit this. Ah, there we go. We get an awesome battle against Big Arms. This air quotes secret boss from Sonic 3 is one of my absolute favourites. I just love the design of the machine. So even as a kid, I adored seeing it brought to life in these pages. I also have to give Elson props for changing the shape. It's a perfect spear in game, yet is far more egg-shaped here, playing into Robotnik's design motifs. We also get further proof that the adventure's Robotnik design can look properly menacing. The use of a bright blue shadow here really makes the artwork pop, accentuating the glowing electrical power of the machine he's piloting. Sonic again shows some smarts. He can't break through the mech's defences, so he instead uses the environment to his advantage, causing a cave-in before calling a retreat. After all, he was only buying Porker time. He understands the wind conditions, and keeps his ego in check when it matters. Good news, Kinterbor has been transferred to the ring. Bad news, Robotnik sealed the exits. There's no way out. They're going to have to make a last stand. It's at this point that Robotnik gets a call from Grimer, claiming that Knuckles is dead after attacking the launch base zone. Now, this could have been effective. We last saw Knuckles approaching launch base to destroy the Death Egg, if it hadn't been revealed that Knuckles is alive and well on the same page. Again, seven pages, I get it, there's no room to breathe, but there's literally a single panel between the audience being told Knuckles has been killed and us seeing he's actually fine. With this being a two-part story, we could have ended with the reported death and then, two weeks later, shown him to be alive in part two. It's a massive missed opportunity, and would have only pushed the Empire Strikes Back vibe of this story, ending part one on a true down note. Issue 38 picks up right where we left off. Sonic and crew are surrounded, as Sonic reassures Porker they'll be okay in what I'm fairly sure is a bluff. Robotnik bursts through the wall in a gorgeous panel. The Big Arms mech is so big and imposing that it actually breaks the panel borders. 
In terms of composition, Sonic is claustrophobically squeezed between his enemy's face and a massive fist. This conveys so much power and peril, while again smartly implying a legion of badniks, despite only drawing two of them. This single panel is proof that Elson is truly a master of his craft. Just as it looks like Sonic's on the ropes, Knuckles bursts into the scene and breaks the... windshield? Yeah, I'm gonna go with windshield. This allows Sonic to slice the top of the mech off, exposing Robotnik as Knuckles digs the team away above ground. So this is again where the comic's page count causes the storytelling to suffer. I would have loved to have seen Robotnik toy with Sonic, play with his food and gloat, just twist a knife in for both the characters and the reader before Knuckles came to the rescue. Likewise, the exchange between Robotnik and Knuckles reinforces my idea for the end of the previous issue. Grimer told me you were dead. He told you what I wanted him to. Job done! With that, we can remove the final panel of issue 37 altogether, let the audience sit with the slim possibility that they killed off a new and popular main character off screen, and then provide relief here, two weeks later. Although, I'm not sure what Knuckles gains from Robotnik thinking he's dead. Again, there's a very restrictive page count, but I'd like to have seen Knuckles use this deceit to quietly dismantle Robotnik's infrastructure on the floating island over the course of a few issues. Knuckles showing up to assist Sonic would have still been a surprise to Robotnik, even if he thought he was alive. The Mad Doctor arrives in big arms for this assault before getting the report from Grimer, and this mech is shown to be something Knuckles can punch through. So it's not like Robotnik factored Knuckles' involvement into his plans anyway. And yeah, maybe I'm nitpicking, but the fake-out death really could be removed from the story, and it would still play out in exactly the same way. It's especially important to cut things like this when you only have seven pages per issue. Remember, Sonic the Comic is an anthology book, as are many British comics. There are usually four stories having to share the 30-ish page count, some of which are for other non-Sonic Sega properties, so each story gets allocated between four and seven pages per fortnightly issue. Even at the maximum page count of seven, a single part of a Fleetway story has around a third of the page count of an Archie or IDW story. Yes, you heard me correctly, a Sonic the Comic 3 parter has the page count of one IDW book. The story we're reviewing today spanned seven issues back then, but would only account for around two books today. Back to the story. With room to breathe, Sonic, Knuckles, and Johnny team up to take on waves of badniks, as well as trooper reinforcements. Robotnik really is throwing everything at this team in an effort to put a stop to their resistance for good. It culminates in one of my favourite pages ever, a full-page spread of Sonic, Knuckles, and Johnny fighting off waves of badniks as Robotnik escapes. I could seriously see myself getting this printed and framed for my wall. The dialogue here also starts establishing an ongoing friendly banter and rivalry between Sonic and Knuckles that would come to define their relationship. Although, more on that when we get into the AND Knuckles portion of the story. The scale and duration of the battle is wonderfully implied at the start of the next page. Robot debris litters the ground, sharing the same brown colouring so they don't pull focus or distract the reader. With multiple layers of smoke rising from the ground, it tells us the trio made an epic last stand while respecting the limited page count. This is how you do it. Sonic asks why Knuckles helped, reminding the Red Bruiser that he didn't consider overthrowing Robotnik to be his fight. Knuckles felt responsible for Robotnik discovering where Sonic's secret base was, and therefore duty-bound to help in this instance. Now, it categorically wasn't Knuckles' fault. Sonic and Tails captured Robotnik and were dumb enough to have his holding cell inside their main base of operations, instead of a separate satellite or holding facility. Knuckles had nothing to do with that, he merely followed the Doctor's tracking signal to the hideout after the fact. Anyway, semantics aside, Knuckles leaves as Sonic and Freedom Fighters take on a new guise, roaming Mobius under the cover of a travelling circus. Given the return of Sonic's Bob Beaky disguise, first seen in issue 10's Megatox, and the fact that the team left in a hurry, I assume this caravan was always a backup plan, just in case. 
Either way, this starts a new era of the comic, where the Freedom Fighters are more mobile, allowing greater storytelling opportunities away from the, by this point, overly familiar and somewhat stale setting of the Emerald Hill Village. A lot happens in these seven issues, and you might have noticed it has very little to do with the events of Sonic 3 being an incredibly loose adaptation. That's likely because the story started before Sonic & Knuckles came out, ending a mere four days before the second part of most people's favourite Sonic saga hit store shelves. Nigel and Richard probably didn't know what would happen in what was essentially Sonic 3 Part 2, so made the, in my opinion, smart decision to stick with their own characters, universe, and lore, while borrowing as few elements from the games as possible. They even smartly wrote around continuity errors, like the Death Egg having already crash-landed into the sea in the comics canon. Given that, it's interesting that they have Knuckles switch sides long before the games would confirm his true allegiances. I'm going to say that's an educated prediction on Nigel's part, as even the UK manual for Sonic 3 says, Dr. Robotnik tricks Knuckles, the guardian of the floating island's Chaos Emeralds, which also implies the island set are separate to Mobius's and may be what gave Kitching that impression. It goes on to say, he also tells Knuckles that Sonic and Tails are the ones trying to steal the Emeralds. So yeah, that makes it pretty obvious that Knuckles will eventually learn the truth and defect. The only thing Nigel and Richard didn't know was how, as that happens in the second game of this duology. The approach would be flipped entirely for the and Knuckles part of the story. The pair were clearly inspired by that game, as a ton of its moments get more faithfully and directly translated into the comic pages, but that's for next time. Sonic the Comic's main plot did take something of a break after this, presumably while the creators played through and then workshopped their adaptation of the next game. That's not to say there weren't some decent stories told in that gap, though. A rest period that simply doesn't exist in the source material. Knuckles would return to the floating island and face off against the Marxio Bros. We met this trio previously when Sonic and Porker infiltrated the Casino Night Zone. This time they're in charge of Carnival Night and bringing tourists to the floating island, much to Knuckles' irritation. It's a fun six-part story that shows Kitching and Nelson getting more comfortable with Knuckles' characterization, writing and drawing him as if they'd been at it for years. Sadly, as a backup story, it was only assigned five pages per issue, so it's again about one and a half issues worth of IDW. Badnik's Bridge is one of my top ten Sonic the Comic stories. The Freedom Fighters learn that the delivery route for a new thruster for the Death Egg will pass over a bridge. They quickly decide to blow up the bridge, trashing the thruster and delaying the Death Egg's eventual repair, which is coincidentally how the comic justifies the gap between adaptations. Sonic jumps a gun, gets captured, and has his bombs discovered. He has to improvise alongside Amy and Johnny to get the job done. Likewise, we have the Big Con, which sees the team infiltrate Robotnik Con, an official convention for all his air quotes, supporters. Attendance is mandatory, supervised by troopers, and a massive ego trip for the Doctor. Oh yeah, it's also secretly a Badnik processing plant, with every con attendee being turned into one of Robotnik's minions. Sonic, Tails, and Porker disrupt the show, destroying both a statue commemorating Robotnik and the Badnik factory itself. These are some of the best examples of the Freedom Fighters acting as their namesake implies. We see them being an active and effective resistance to a tyrannical dictator, and I wish we'd gotten more tales like this. Lou Stringer's Enter the Cybernik is a three-parter that introduces Short Fuse, a fan-favorite comic-exclusive character. This is a super badnik with impenetrable armor. Unfortunately for Robotnik, the brainwashing program goes awry and Shorty keeps his own mind and will, giving Sonic and friends another powerful ally. Finally, Ice Cap Attack sees Sonic and Knuckles reluctantly team up after Robotnik creates a portal that teleports Badniks from the floating island directly to Mobius, making it a shared problem for the pair. I mainly enjoy this one for its dialogue and depiction of the friendly rivalry between the pair. Importantly, it ends with Knuckles telling Sonic not to trespass on the floating island again, and yeah, that's relevant for all of one line in the Sonic and Knuckles adaptation. Speaking of, I'll see you next time for Sonic the Comics adaptation of Sonic and Knuckles. 
it's one of the book's best stories, so make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. You can also support the channel by joining my Patreon. Just like the wonderful Crow, Tiny Jericho, Mr. Terry Chaos, Ducky Go, Francis T218, and Deliverator. Likewise, huge thanks to Dan200 for the amazing restoration work on these pages, and Sonic the Comic the Podcast for their continued celebration of this book. If you're aching for more British people waxing about STC, give them a listen.